our Shastra, they say that the truth is ekam eva advitiya. There's only one truth. And though we might have heard this many, many times, it still hasn't sunk in for most of us. It's still not thinking in. We're still doubting it. And in Panchadeshi, it says very beautifully, how can we doubt this truth? How can we doubt it? Swayam eva anubhutitvat. It's ever experienced. When we see this book, we think we're only seeing the book. And when we see this watch, we think we're only seeing the watch. But what are we actually seeing? We're seeing this book pervaded by light. Right? We are seeing this watch pervaded by light. So it is so strange to doubt that our nature is pure consciousness because every seeing, hearing, smelling, tasting, touching is pervaded by consciousness. Hmm? And sometimes we become so funny that we say we need to see consciousness. Right? I need to see this Atma that everybody is talking about. I need to hear about this Atma. I need to even think about this Atma. Well, that Atma illumines the eyes. And without Atma, without consciousness, the eyes cannot see. So how are the eyes going to prove Atma? If because of Atma, the eyes see. Hmm? Because of consciousness, the mind can think. Huh? How will the mind prove consciousness if consciousness proves the mind? See how silly this is? So we are in a realm that no matter how much we've heard this knowledge, no matter how much we've studied it, we still feel we need to prove consciousness. Hmm? I need to prove it. And we, we feel that because it's the only thing that's of the nature of self-experience. It's the only thing that's not experienced as an object. For everything else, we have to bring it in front of us to experience it. Hmm? For me to experience you, I have to <clears throat> objectify you. For me to experience this book, I have to objectify the book. But for consciousness, we don't have to objectify or bring it in front of us. It is us. So it's the only thing that we experience that is not an object. And because we're not used to experiencing things that are not objects, we think that we've never experienced it. So the ultimate truth is this, that this is our nature, our pure consciousness. And there's only one. And it is ever experienced. In Kenopanishad, it says, Pratibodha viditam matam. It is experienced in every thought. In every thought, there is awareness. And to doubt that we don't experience it is quite silly. Hmm? But what happens is we're not attuned to that experience. That's what's happening. So because we don't understand this, and because we're also scared, sometimes we're scared because to attune ourselves to this, we have to dissolve the ego. It means the ego has to get lost, has to dissolve itself. But Guruji says very beautifully, you know what's Vedanta? Vedanta is the ego's anta. And the ego's afraid to, to have its end. So it doesn't want you to study Vedanta. Huh? <laughs> the ego will try to do all things to push you away from studying Vedanta. Right? So this ego does not want to dissolve itself, attune itself to this consciousness. It wants to just push itself out. And we're also scared, you know? When people say, remain detached, just be, just be. What will happen to my children? You're telling me to just be. What will happen to my children, right? What will happen to my career? What will happen to my family? You say, just be. Actually, everything happens by itself. To take a bath, do we think about it or not? It just happens, isn't it? It just happens. To brush our teeth, it just happens. So like that, when we re realize and we are attuned to our nature, everything just happens. We don't have to worry about it. So we are 
we're in a state where we are ever experiencing consciousness, it is our true nature, but we are afraid to be attuned to it. We're afraid to dissolve that ego. And there's a beautiful story by Rabindranath Tagore. He says, you know, I discovered the house where God lives. I found it out. I found out the house where God lives. I researched everything. I mapped it out. I know exactly that, that point where God lives. I know what the house looks like. And there's even a sign there. This is the house where God lives. Huh? Second floor. And he said, guess what? I made my way there. I went to that house that had the sign, I know where God lives. And it said, go walk up the second floor. And he said, I was so excited, so excited, I'm going to meet God. And I went up to the second floor. And I was about to knock on the door. Then what happened? I said, gosh, if I meet God, what will happen to all of my longing, all of my achievements, all of my goals, all of my wants, all of my actions, my to-do list, what will happen? It might disappear. I better not meet God. I better, he's about to knock. He said, I better not meet God. And he carefully, carefully dipped down the, tiptoed down the stairs and he walked out. And he said, now I know where God lives, but I'm not gonna go there. I'm not gonna go there because I don't know what's gonna happen to my life. And so he says, I live my life Knowing where God lives, but not going there. I just know where he lives, but I'm not going to go. This is what happens to us. Mm -hmm. We know where that divinity lives, but we're afraid to go. We're afraid to go deep, deep inside. Mm -hmm. So this series is going to help us go inside. Not be afraid to discover where that truth lives. Mm. So we have gone from our nature's pure consciousness to us uh, identifying with our ego and being afraid to discover who we are. And because of that, what is the, the consequence? We identify with this limited BMI, right? We identify with this limited BMI. And where's the strongest identification? Strongest identification is with the, which kosha? Wrong, the sixth one, the phone, mobile phone. <laughs> That's the strongest identification, huh? That's the strongest identification. But that I won't tackle today. <laughs> I'll tackle the second strongest one, which is Annamaya Kosha. Okay? Do you see where we have become in the world, huh? Our strongest identification with mobile Maya Kosha. We lose our cell phones, the world ends. But luckily we're Hindu, so the world goes round and round again. <laughs> right? Okay, so we identify with this. And what is this? This is called the body of a woman. It's called the body of a woman. And how beautiful is the body of a woman we're going to see through Navadurga. Navadurga. Mm -hmm. So please come in here. Yeah. In Navaratri, we know uh, some ways it's celebrated is three days for Durga Devi, three days for Lakshmi Devi, and three days for Saraswati. We also celebrate the nine different forms of Durga Devi and how she emerges as a full woman. Hmm? So this is what we'll see. What is a woman? Because sometimes women also don't know what women are. <laughs> and one time I gave this talk and they said, you know, why don't you give this talk to men? I said, you yourself didn't know this, right? They said, yeah, we didn't know. I <laughs> said, so, the first stage of a woman is called Shaila Putri. Shaila Putri. I know 
know some of you might have heard these terms, but we'll look at it in a different light today. <coughs> Shaila Putri is that Sati Devi who she incarnated as the daughter of Himavan. Huh? So now she is known as Parvati. And she's Shaila Putri, she's a daughter of the mountains. She comes as a daughter of a household. And to us, daughter is Lakshmi. Daughter is Lakshmi. When a daughter enters the house, when a daughter is born, she brings both inner and outer wealth. She brings the inner wealth of virtue, the outer wealth of sustenance. That's why when Lakshmi comes, when Lakshmi is born, we should never keep her out. There is this notion that I, you know, that some people say that how come in our shastras a male child is preferred? How come they say let let's give birth to a man? People pray for a man. So I sat with one of our Swamiji's and I said, "What is this?" He said, "This is the reason." In Sanatana Dharma, we had a lot of war, lots of war, particularly in Mahabharata. Huh? Millions and millions and millions of people died, lost their lives. And we know that even in, uh, in Bharat, we were invaded for centuries. Millions of people lost their lives. Primarily, those people who lost their lives were men. They were male. And now, just think about it. If there is such a millions died, not thousands, not hundreds, millions died. So many million of men died. Predominantly, they were the ones in the battlefield. Not that women were not there, they were. But a lot of men were there. And because a lot of them died, if it was just women left, then there would be an imbalance in society. So at that time, to reduce that imbalance, yes, they did pray for a male child. But not because a male child is better, but because they wanted to again re-establish that balance in society. So when the daughter comes to the house, she is Lakshmi, Shailaputri. And we see this also in the story of Anda. The story of Anda, uh, her father was Vishnu Chitta. She's the first uh, story that we see in Woman Seeker. And he was a great bhakta of Sri Krishna. And one day, by a tulsi plant, he found this beautiful baby girl. And she, he named her Godha. Godha means gift of Bhagavan. He named her Godha. And he was so happy and he raised her with such love and such devotion. And so she rose in love with Bhagavan Krishna. She would think about Bhagavan Krishna all the time. So much to the point that Vishnu Chitta used to make these garlands to offer to Ranganatha Swami at the temple. And what did Godha do? She used to wear, she used to wear those garlands, right? She used to wear those garlands and pretend that she was a bride of Krishna. And one day when her father found out that she was wearing the garlands because there was hair in it, he got so mad and he made a new garland. And he offered that to Bhagavan Krishna. But what did Bhagavan Krishna say? He said, no. He came in Vishnu Chitra's dream and said, no, give me the garland that is offered by you. Your daughter Godha. I want the garland with the smell of Godha's hair. I want that garland. And Vishnu Chitta cried. He said, I thought I was a devotee, but look at my daughter. She taught me how to be an even greater devotee. Huh? And this is the glory of Godha. And she became Arnal. First woman Alvar saint. Mm -hmm. So Shaila Putri is when she comes as daughter, she comes as Lakshmi. Mm -hmm. Second stage of a woman is Brahmacharini, huh? where a woman now she studies. She studies. And she lives a life of discipline. Now, another uh, wrong notion that people feel, sometimes, you know, when there were a lot of invasions in Bharat, mainly the women were 
mistreated, women and children, because they knew that the woman is the seat of a culture. When a woman is taken from a family, the whole culture and spirituality, it dies. Because who, who, who brings the children to Bali <laughs> Yesterday, one grandmother said she drives six of her grandkids to Baal Vihar. Yes, ah, there she is. Yeah. To see. So, so who, brings, who brings education at home? That is that, that mother. A mother is the one who brings education at home. Who, who's the one who chants? Uh, who chants all the time? Also, yesterday we were talking, somebody gave an example how she picked up chanting, how someone picked up chanting, because her grandma kept chanting when she was young. Her grandma kept chanting, kept chanting, so automatically she just picked it up. So the seed of a nation's culture lies in the woman. Education, whether it is education in India, secular education or spiritual education or cultural education. So they felt that if we take the woman, the culture will suffer. So what happened as time passed by is women then studied mostly at home because they were if they had gone to school they would be harmed so they studied at home. Now a big misnomer here is that because they didn't go through some formal education yeah, education system they were not educated they were educated more at home because at home not only were they educated in all the aspects of the household, but on the Puranas, on, on the Itihasas, on the Shastras, on how to chant. So please don't think that if women studied at home, they were not educated. They were even far more educated than some people who formerly went to school, both men and women. Hmm? So Brahmacharini doesn't mean a woman who had gone through actual university with master's degree and PhD. This is a, a woman who learned about life. Because there are more than enough people of all genders who have gone through a master's degree and PhD who know zero about life. <laughs> right? <laughs> so, Brahmacharini means this. A woman who has learned about life was learned about all aspects in life. And there's so much beautiful teaching from our own parents, from our own siblings. Huh? Just watching them grow, we learn. And that's why Gurukula system was beautiful. Because you stayed with the Guru. And that's how you learned. Now the third stage of a woman is Chandra Ganda. Chandra Ganda is God is in a married form. Hmm? Now, not, not all women will have a family, uh, a typical kind of family, but all women will marry. Either they will marry their own husband, either they will marry Bhagavan, <coughs> either they will marry in terms of, they'll marry the nation, they'll marry society, but they will marry. So Chandra Ganta is now a woman who is ready to get married and getting married. Now here also you can see the strength of a woman. <coughs> Extremely adaptable. Somebody asked, you know, how come the woman has to move to the husband's home? How come the husband doesn't move to the wife's home? I said, have you ever seen a man adapt? <laughs> they cannot adapt to anything. They're very set in their ways. Not all, some of them. Very set. That I want this. I only want this. And to the extent that they buy one t-shirt, they want six shirts of the same kind. They buy all the same, same, same kind because that's just the way they think. If they, they're, they're eating, they can eat the same food all the time. No problem. I, I just want this, just like this. They want their desk and everything fixed in a certain way. They are very fixed. Most of them are like that. But who is the most adaptable person in the household? The mother. The woman. The most adaptable. She is so flexible. 
that okay, this doesn't work. Okay, I'll 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 work things around. No, she knows everybody's schedule. She puts in the fridge. This person, that person, this. Person. She knows everybody's schedule. She's the only one in the house who knows everybody's schedule. And if there's some kind of clash, who will adjust? She will adjust. She's the most adaptable. Hmm? So Chandra Ganda is when we see the strength of a woman's adaptability. She has that capability of embracing the whole family. The whole family, whoever it is, she has that capability. And she invites them into her heart. And she puts forth effort to make everything work. Huh? So beautifully. And she does it like, she doesn't have this pride, you know, why do I have to adjust, why do I have to do this? She understands this is my role. Everybody has their role. And we will go to that also. We will see a woman's role in a man's role. We will go to that. First, see the glory of woman. Mm. Chandra Ranta. Then, the fourth stage is Kushmanda. Kushmanda now, where she is going to give birth. Going to give birth. Now, here, she carries life in her belly. So this again misnomer shouldn't be there that some people think that only men are physically strong. You please remove that from your mind. Men have some physical strength because we see a lot of the construction workers, right? A lot of the ones who are lifting boxes, a lot of them may be men. But when you go to the Himalayas, who's carrying the load? So women, the women in the mountain. Hmm? We went on Yatra. Who was scared? I was so shocked. We have such big, big duffel bags. We are also, uh, you know how much we pack is just ridiculous. Huh? <laughs> <laughs> big, big duffel bags. And we're thinking, who's going to carry it up the mountain? Oh, these women, they're so strong. They just lift it on top of their heads. And I'm just like, oh my God. Wow. Hmm? So again, there's this misnomer that women are not physically strong, they are. And everybody who carries a baby in their womb, are you not physically strong? For nine months you're carrying that baby. Anybody else can do that? That's not easy. You ask a male to play basketball, they can play for one hour. You play basketball for nine months. <laughs> that requires a lot of strength. Okay, so that Kushmanda is when the woman, she is all, all strength carrying that form of life in her womb. And that is a very beautiful state. It's not easy. Sometimes there's morning sickness. Sometimes something, sometimes in the beginning stages you have to figure out how to sleep. How to sleep with this big bed. The fingers are like, they how to turn. And yet carrying that baby in the belly, she still manages everything. Some people are still working, some people are still in the kitchen, some people are still doing this, driving, doing everything. And they're getting ready to bear life. And not only once. Huh? Not only once. That's true. Not only once. Sometimes twice, sometimes twice, sometimes four times. Huh? Sometimes six. That, that is now you don't see. She's not just like this country, this place. 
You should feel that we are going to our mother's place. <coughs> She's Bharat Mata. And actually there's a temple for Bharat Mata, you know? And the glory of Bharat Mata is that she can accommodate everybody. Huh? So now, if you think of the population of Bharat, it's over one billion. How many languages are there? How many different cultures? How many different traditions? How many different religions? How many different customs? All of it is accommodated in this one glorious nation called Bharat. So many different languages. In New York City, when you walk in a street, you hear different languages, but they're, they're from different countries, you know? So then it's nice. You walk around the street and there's like six different languages. I feel like, wow. But in Bharat, when you walk down the street, there's six different Indian languages. And they talk to each other in their own language and they understand. <laughs> That's the beauty of it. Huh? Somebody is speaking Tamil, the other person is speaking Telugu, but they understand each other. Now, I have never seen something like that. <laughs> so that is a wonder. So in Bharat, there is a spirit of accommodation. Hmm? And uh, once I had gone to Uttarkashi on a yatra, and I took a bus from Rishikesh to Uttarkashi. And when I got on the bus, I got there the first stop in the morning, 5.30 a.m. I was so happy because the driver said, you sit in front. And I sat in front and I had space for my backpack also. I said, very nice. Listen to that, I know that this is not how the bus in India is. <laughs> As we were going up and up, so many people started riding in the bus. So many people started riding in the bus. So I, I started putting my backpack in my lap. Then just when I thought the bus was full, more people came in the bus. And so from sitting like this, I was sitting like this. <laughs> and it was a six hour journey. And as we're going up, up Uttarkashi, some school children said, Baya, Baya, we need to go to school. Can we get on the bus? He said, ah, chalo. Where are you going to sit? Let's stand on the bus. Let's stand on the bus. And then we passed by this market. She said, oh, Baya, I have this, all this, my sabji and everything. He said, chalo, chalo, come. Oh, she took it in the bus. I'm like, wow, I've never seen something like this. That so many people are accommodated in one bus. And uh, this driver was just driving and driving and driving. And he said, we'll go, we'll go and accommodate whoever we can. We'll take them. And uh, it, it worked. It really worked. Huh? Now, who was the most accommodating person in the house? It was Jaitapa Madhya. Somebody wants to eat dal chawal. Somebody says, Mom, I, I can't do Indian anymore. I'm done. <laughs> I want Italian. Right? So there's one child who will say something like that. Then another child will say, Can you just make like some snacky thing? I want some snacky thing. Right? And then the husband will come and say, I just want something else, you know? Now she can looking at everybody, she will make something that everybody can eat. Isn't that? That's the mom. And you have guests coming. Now everybody, you know, the guests coming. How many guests are coming? Two. Oh, but they're bringing somebody, so now three. No, but now, now there's going to be five, six people. Immediately she knows how to accommodate everything and everybody, including here, Anna Byudaya. All of our organizers and coordinators, they know how to accommodate everybody and everything. That is the strength of a mom. She's like Bharat Mata. Hmm? The other Mata that we have is Bhumi Mata. Hmm? Strength of a mother is Bhumi Mata. She is like earth. Now, who is the most forgiving person in the world? A mother. Mother Earth is so forgiving that no matter how much we pollute, we overconsume, we disregard her also, still she holds us. She's still holding us. Huh? That's why when we get up, we first touch Bhumi Mata. We touch her feet. Samudra Vasani, we touch her feet. Because you're still holding us. How much we have harmed you. 
We have been so negligent. We have just wasted things, wasted food, wasted all of this. Still you're holding me together, Bhumi Mata. Still you're holding me. What about our mother? How many times we rolled our eyes? <laughs> to our mom. Slap the door. We said, Mom, you just don't understand. How many times? Hmm? So many times. We raised our voice to our mom. We got mad. We stopped talking to our mom. She made food with so much love. We said, You go to a beach, you just want to run and splash yourself. We don't greet her like that. The Himalayas, the sadhus, will first do namaskar to her, bow down to her. Then only they will go in. Because she is Mata. That one body of water nourishes everything from a little ant to the biggest creature. People drink her water, bathe in her water, wash their clothes in her water. They pray in her water. All the creatures are nourished by her water. And like that, the mother, she nourishes everybody in all ways. With love, with care, with attention, with sustenance, with food, with drink. She nurtures and nourishes everybody in all ways. Not only that, but when we look at Ganga Maya, she's so persistent. She's always flowing towards her ocean. Always flowing. Always flowing towards the ocean. She, she never looks back. No, she keeps going. No matter what, she keeps going. She keeps going. She keeps going. She keeps going. All the time. Now, have you ever seen a mother who has to do something for her child and you come in her way? <laughs> Don't come in her way. <laughs> you will lose. Huh? When a mother wants something for her child, she will go and go and go till the end. That's how all Baldihar start. <laughs> all these mothers come. They say, my child has to learn about our religion and our culture. But there's no class. What do I do? I will start it. Then that one mom, she will make the whole community move. I've seen this five, six, seven times. <laughs> All our moms do this. They, when they want something for the child, the whole community will shake. Will shake. Because their persistence is unparalleled. I have never seen persistence like that. In fact, I learned how to be more persistent when I was looking at that. Huh? So like Ganga Mata, they just persist. Hmm? Women are also like Shruti Mata. Hmm? What is Shruti Mata's gift? Veda. Veda, knowledge. And what does she do? She says the same thing again and again and again. Hmm. Huh? All the Upanishads have the same message. Mundaka, Mandukya, Taitriya, Bhagavad Gita. Everything has the same message. But she'll say it in different ways. But she's saying the same thing again and again and again. What we studied in the first session of Vedanta is not different from this session of Vedanta also. Who repeats the most in the house? Again and again and again and again. Huh? But what we have to learn from Shruti Mata is to learn how to repeat it in a different way. That's, a, that, that's natural to us. It's natural. We are Mata. It's natural. We will repeat. But we have to learn how to repeat in a, how glorious are Shruti's, how they repeat it. 
First, it will be Tattva Masi. Then it will be Aham Brahmasmi. Then I am Atma Brahma. There's a twist to the repetition, you see? So we also have to learn how to twist that repetition. So don't worry if we are repeating, repeating. We are women. That's our nature. It's okay. And women are also like Gaumata. Gaumata. To us, the cow is mother. Because she takes the least, she gives the most. She eats only grass, but she gives milk, her urine is medicine, her cow dung provides, you know, insulation. When she passes, she leaves her body, her skin is used. So she takes the least, but she gives the most. Now, in, in everybody's homes, who takes the least and gives the most? Very often, she'll cook an entire meal, but she won't get food. Hmm? That is a mom. Right? So when a woman becomes a mother, all these qualities become so strong in her accommodation of Bharatamata, the forgiveness of Bhumi Mata, the nourishment and persistence of Ganga Maya, the beautiful repetition and care of Shruti Mata. And that repetition is to give the highest knowledge, to give it for our welfare. She is Shruti Mata. She is repeating and repeating. <laughs> She also takes the least but gives the most. <coughs> this is automatic for a mom. Automatic. <coughs> Next, the sixth stage is Kadhyayini. This is now when the mom, she emerges as a warrior goddess. She's a warrior goddess now. And she's ready to rumble. She's ready to fight. Why? Because as a mother, now she has the responsibility of everything. The entire household, the entire family, and she stands up to also embrace the community. That's the beauty of a mom. So she looks now beyond her household, and she comes, she serves the community, and she's a warrior because she's got so many weapons, so many arms, and she's got her hands fully engaged. And she perseveres with strength. So as Katyayani, she emerges now to serve also her community. And she sees her community as her family. Her family becomes big. It increases. Then, seventh stage of a woman is Kalaratri. Kalaratri. You will see this form of Durga Devi. She looks fierce, sometimes scary. This is when a woman goes through menopause. Ma. 
how gory. This is when a woman becomes a grandmother. Now, the grandmother has a has such a beautiful shine. They don't put makeup. They don't dye their hair. They don't wear this. You know, like some grandmothers, okay, you do. Yeah. <laughs> but, some, but I tell you, the most beautiful people are the grandmothers. There is something in them that is just so radiant. So they may not dye their hair, they may not dress with all this makeup and stuff, they might not wear all this jewelry, but when you're with a grandma, my God, she's beautiful. Isn't she? She's beautiful. And not only she's outwardly beautiful, but when you're with her, you feel like just this warmth, this comfort, this love that surpasses any being. I feel like that when I'm with people who I uh, feel are my grandma. Like my dad's older sister, like that. Just amazing, amazing. So for this Mahagodi, she just brings radiance, love, and comfort to everybody. Not only that, but wisdom. Because she's lived for so long, she has this maturity. Oh, the wisdom of a grandmother is unparalleled. Unparalleled. Wow. She will tell you exactly what you need to do in the simplest ways. No complication. Sometimes also when we read scripture, we find it so complicated. Uh, you know that you are without a body, but you are in all bodies. Find something like that, paradoxical, which we have to do one another. Our grandmother will just tell us in simple, simple ways. Remember, this is not you. This is not you, you are beyond that. And she will tell in such a way where she has experienced it. She knows it. And it hits home. So she's a board of wisdom, a grandmother. The final stage in a woman's life is Siddhi Dhatri. Right? This is where she emerges as an enlightened being. And now, just her presence itself is a blessing. Just her presence itself. She doesn't need to go out in the community to serve. She doesn't need to nourish the family to serve. She doesn't even need to speak and give wisdom to serve. Just by being there, her mere presence, everybody is served. What a beautiful thing. Huh? Just to be. Just to be. This is how a woman emerges. These are all nine stages of a woman's life. So all women have to go through this. And as I said, some might not have family, family is a typical family, but from some their family will be society, the family will be the world. But they emerge this way. So it's from a woman to a Jagan Mata. So you see the title of the book is Woman Seeker. But the last chapter, Jagan Mata. Because that's how we have to emerge. From Shaila Putri to Brahmacharini to Chandraganta through Kushmanda, Skandamata, Kadyayani, Kalaraki, Mahagauri, and Siddhi Dhatri. This is a woman. Now see how beautiful can you be? Yeah? Right. I will leave us with this thought. I won't start with the next uh, thought. Next thought we will do in the next session. So we will just pause for a moment in silence. Just sit straight. Just be silent.
See where you are. <coughs> and feel that glory of being a woman. chant a short food followed by prayer. You can just listen. Jam. 